um, to tonight's reading. Um, welcome to the PNCA Low Residency Summer 2020. Um, this is also a moment um, in which um, I can just share with you that this program officially turns one year old. Uh, it is officially one years old, and it un unofficially is, you know, is several years old. But um, so I'm really, we will have readings um, uh, five nights um, over the course of our residency. And um, for more details, you can go to the um, PNCA Low Residency Creative Writing uh, web page, and um, you can find details about all of our events. Tonight, we have three readers. It's not my um, I'm so excited. Our three readers are Alejandro, um, Sarah Jaffe, and Vicky Now. And we're also going to be streaming. This is being streamed on YouTube, on PNCA's YouTube channel. So um, I'm so excited to introduce our faculty readers. Oh, and my name is Jay. I don't even know if I said that. My name is Jay Pontier. Um, so our first reader this evening is Alejandro de Acosta. Alejandro is a teacher, writer, and translator in no particular order. He also helps people make books. He has translated philosophy and poetry from Spanish and French. He has also published two books of critical and experimental essays. He still lives in Olympia, Washington. Welcome, Alejandro. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I still live in Olympia, Washington, because before COVID, I was going to move. Um, so now it feels like uh, I made a decision. It's not just putting where you live at the end of your uh, bio. Let me get uh, one last sound check before I start. Am I, am I good? Do I? Yes. OK, great. So um, tonight, I'm going to be reading um, a series of seven translations and then a brief life. Um, that's, that's something I'm gonna be talking about at the talk I'll be doing at the end of the residency, a brief life written by me, which features translation as part of it. And as you'll see, I appear and disappear in the course of the readings of the series. Um, all of this material was translated specifically for you for this residency, as I like to do. It's all fresh, it's all new, you're all hearing it for the first time. The first is a poem. The rest of it is some kind of prose, except for the last, which is, is prose with some kind of poetry in it. Um, I also think it's important to say that one of the pieces towards the beginning makes a, what you could call a sort of abstract reference to suicide, self-mutilation, and sexual violence. Um, that'll be over in the first couple of minutes. Um, at the end, I will give credits to the authors, but I'm gonna read them as a straightforward sequence because that is how they happen to me. Um, so we're going to start with a translation of a poem about translation that is on the face of it an untranslatable poem. And it's called, well, actually everything here has a date first, so I'll say the date and then what it's called. 2012, the translator into Japanese asks a question. The translator into Japanese asks, Japanese. Is that a person or a language? By way of wordplay, there aren't people, rather languages that engender tongues, twisted by babble effect that makes people talk in the tongue of O, in the tongue of A. O is other, A is alien, O is male, A is female. 
By way of person play, there aren't tongues, rather sexes, organs of me and you that fit together and are lost in each other. Do they engender language games to self multiply, to self distract? The translator into Japanese asks, what gazes? Is that the eye, the bearer of the eye? What the eye gazes at, the eye and the gazed upon designated together in a single word phrase? Do they make with the bearer a single complex? The gazing complex and the complex gaze, are they complementary, or are they consecutive, antagonistic, autonomous? A gazing that gazes for what? Gazes at it what for? For the? What for? The translator into Japanese asks, what I am doing here? Asking, meaning requesting, requiring, demanding, giving, providing, sharing. When I do it, do I require? or suggest an answer? Do I impose? If the question begins with pre, is the pre a prefix? <laughs> Does it determine precedence, prelation, privilege? Asking someone is subjective. Asking about is objective. Asking for, cause, destiny, direction, If the question has a central G, does it mean that the obstacle in every question is set aside like the G as it passes to the gullet, the gargler? The translator into Japanese asks, speaking on the sea, is that standing on waves, reasoning on a topic, figuring what's unstable and saying? Peculiarity in a tongue, if it existed, should it pass over to the other, as in speaking while standing in the South Atlantic, be repressed according to the conditions of the other, as in speaking about the sea that separates us from China, be invented according to the conditions of the other, as in reasoning at the edge of the volcano, be modified, be adapted, as in stuttering with your head in the tiger's jaws, be devalued as a problem. The translator into Japanese asks about a tongue that I once considered my own. And the more he asks, he makes it more O, more A. O is other. A is alien. Nineteen fifty four. The suicide. There is in some natures a kind of resistance to culture if they are forced, and that's what's bad about compulsory primary ed education, they produce monstrosities. With them, you have to stop at the alphabet and the abacus. That's enough for them. And in this case, it's the only healthy thing. To want to take them further is to encourage the proliferation of specimens like that of our strangler of women who would try to resuscitate his victims through intercourse. Remember the amusing case that Jules Romain tells in one of the volumes of his own De Bonne Volonté like the one who ended up castrating himself to resist the desire to sleep with his sister and who had discovered the secret of doing literary criticism through chemical reactions. Or the other one who wanted to make music on the pianola with the drawings of the Lyon tie makers and invented another kind of dictionary. Like yet another one who claims to be a cannibal and has new theories, false theories about everything or even like that of the one who is still discovering Atlantis and believes that he has invented the problem. Like that of some creators of strange and unknown philosophies.
May 18, 1955. Simplification, motor of history. Even better. In history, there are rhythms of complexity and simplification. Maybe a pendulum action of excesses. The intricate and ultra refined are replaced by the savagely simplistic, the learned and decadent by the illiterate. Scholastic theology, with its pickiness and cobwebs, explains the triumph of Islam, a broom that swept away the reliefs of ideological indigestion. The extremes of written bureaucracy will perhaps be replaced by another era of oral tyrants. Wednesday, October 14th, 1931. How to write a novel. The editor in chief of the newspaper came by the office at nine in the morning, another time at three in the afternoon, one night at 9 p.m., once in the wee hours at 2 a.m. He always finds me surrounded with paper, looking like an outlaw with a seven day beard, a huge pair of scissors beside me, the glue pot close to empty. And then the editor in chief stops in front of me and says, what the hell are you doing? You write all day and you only turn in something once in a blue moon. I had to tell the truth. My dear boss, I am finishing my novel, Flamethrowers, which will come out at the end of the month. Good. Then write something about how to write a novel. My pleasure. It's also advertising. How to write a novel. Many people are curious about how to write a novel, what the author's work consists of. Let's investigate. When the author sets to work, the characters involved in the plot are more or less fully sketched. That is to say, they have been taking shape for a more or less lengthy span of time in his imagination. There are authors that make a strict plan and don't for a second consider deviating from it. Example, Flaubert. But others can never figure out if their novel will conclude in carnage or a wedding. Example, Pirandello. Some are so organized that they make notes with this kind of detail. The character will sneeze. On page 92, line seven, others have no idea what they will do. This is what happened to Dostoevsky, whose novel Crime and Punishment was originally a short story for a magazine. Imperceptibly, the story became a complex and frightening novel. The pure blood novelist loathes method, even if he accepts it. He hates plans and everything that could imply being subject to a predictable pattern. Somehow, he writes what he carries inside him, which takes the form of one, or 10 characters. So as not to lose the threads entirely, he makes outlines with the major aspects of the plot. The material accumulates as the months pass. Problems for the author. For the born novelist, characters bring the same surprises as living creatures. For example, at a given moment, X insults N, despite everything the writer had foreseen. The author says to himself, it's absurd that X should insult N. He can't insult him. Later, he forgets this event. One day in a distracted moment, a mysterious voice speaks silently to him, clarifying the unknown. X insulted N, remembering that N had pulled a prank on him once. I had a curious situation in the flamethrowers. A character kills another. The scene was outlined to my satisfaction, the crime appropriately described, but I was still unhappy. Something was not clear to me. Suddenly that voice I was talking to spoke to me. Of course, it was savage for Peter to murder Paul. When Paul came into his room, he was sleepwalking. <laughs> Suddenly I understood a whole host of mysteries. The fixed gaze with which Paul had walked barefoot into the room of his eventual killer. These kinds of problems accumulate for the intuitive author. Instead of an author, we should call him the secretary of invisible personages. He does what they command. Glue and scissors. Once the bulk of the novel is done, the essential part I mean, an author who works in a disorganized way as I do, has to bear down and focus with saintly patience on a great chaos of papers, cutouts, notes highlighted in red and blue pencil. Then the scissoring begins. These 20 lines of part three are superfluous. Chapter five doesn't have enough action. Chapter two has no setting and is too long. Six is too full. The setting, which has no relation to, with the subjective state of the character, can be drawn up last. Sometimes the end of a section is missing. The author left it for later because he didn't think it was that important. 
Now, in a hurry, he realizes he messed up. That ending was really important, and he has to work on it on the fly and write it at vertiginous speed. However, despite all of the inconveniences of the system I presented, this really is the best way to work. After a week of eight or 10 hour days of editing, I've lost 10 pounds. My nerves are on edge. It feels like I'm not working on the ground, but on the crest of some cloud. I look at women with the same indifference a sleepwalker has for the facades of houses. Alejandro de Acosta, author of the novella A Terrible Night, writes here his own autobiography after Roberto Art, Buenos Aires, August 26, 1931. Particulars, 47 years old, five foot nine, Dark hair, now mostly bald or gray, knows how to read and write Spanish and English, reads French, specific tells. Work so far. 25 years teaching, two books of contrarian essays, three translations from the Spanish, education, a doctorate in philosophy, interpretation, and culture, autodidactic research since then. Mental particulars, good humored, patient, needs, few. Ideals, none. <laughs> Beliefs, none in particular. Things that interest him. Men when they have a story. Women when they are legible. Books when they are well written. Defects, a little precious. Can be socially cold to strangers. Self-absorbed tendencies. <laughs> Virtues. Absolute honesty, faith in himself, calm acceptance of every failure and disappointment, a practiced will. Possibilities. If he works hard and is not distracted by cheap successes, he will be a writer of broad appeal. Alejandro de Acosta, Autobiography in Contemporary Argentine Short Stories, 1921-1928. I was born on the 10th of June of the year 1971. I went to elementary schools in Caracas, Venezuela, Madison, Wisconsin, and Shaker Heights, Ohio. From the ages of 14 to 22, I was in high school and college. I didn't get into too much trouble, but my mind began to wander quite a bit. I read a lot of literature. When I was 22, I was in a band. I thought of writing a novel called Mad Toy. For four years, I considered finishing and publishing as I began graduate school. I later found a publisher, but gave them something else. Now I've almost finished what is loosely a novel formed out of narrative threads and poetical aphorisms. I have several interested publishers. Cynical curiosities about me. I like watching crazy people from afar, wondering who is a virgin. And among the scoundrels always have an eye on the charlatans, hypocrites, and the honorable among thieves. Sad truths. I think that the deep servility and inexorable cruelty of the people of our time will never be overcome. I think that we have been chosen for the horrible mission of witnessing the twilight of faith and that we have no other recourse than to write undone by grief so as not to run out into the street to throw bombs or construct whorehouses, although the people would be more grateful to us for the latter. People in general disgust me, and my sole virtue is to only believe in the literary value of my work for five minutes a day. Autobiography by Alejandro de Acosta, 28 February, 1927. My name is Alejandro Felipe Godofredo de Acosta, and I was born some night in 1973 under the conjunction of the planets Saturn and Mercury. I'm a self-made man. My intellectual values are relative because I have not had enough time to learn. I studied for many years without real masters, befriending my teachers, or in groups with my peers. So in writing, I am a newcomer or an improviser. This improvisation is what makes the figure of the ambitious among us so interesting. Those who in one way or another have the instinctive need of affirming their ego. 
I think life is beautiful. We only have to take it on with sincerity, severing off everything that does not better us, not out of love or virtue, but because of egoism, pride, and because the best are those who give the best. I'm currently working on what is loosely a novel formed out of narrative threads and poetical aphorisms with a backbone of character sketches of strong figures, cruel and twisted by the imbalances of our time. My political ideas are simple. I think people need tyrants. What is sad is that there are no great tyrants. Maybe to be a tyrant, you have to be a politician. And to be a politician, you have to be a solemn ass or a great cynic. In literature, I read only Gombrowicz and Arlt. And socially, I have always been more inclined to hang out with scoundrels and charlatans than decent, well-educated liberals. Twenty twenty. Life of Portia. He called them voices, voices, and they sounded like this. Placed here in some faraway nebula, I do what I do, so that the universal balance of which I am a part does not go off balance. Or this. And if I cannot say anything to you, without saying what I say to myself. What I say to you, is it what I say to you or what I say to myself? Or this, my name, rather than calling me, reminds me of my name. Or even this, mud taken out of mud is no longer mud. We might also read these as poems, hear them as sayings, voices that say poems, sayings that voice. Commentators have called them aphorisms, but Antonio Porchia did not agree. Don't ever say that I write aphorisms. I would feel humiliated. He told an interviewer, an aphorism is composed for a particular occasion. Porchia's voices have a timeless resonance. Reason is lost in reasoning. But unlike proverbs that are capable of speaking, in the, they are capable of speaking in the first person. I want because of what I wanted and what I wanted, I would not want it again. Even when he speaks in the first person, Porchia is addressing others, often directly and intimately, not in the writing, but in the presentation. He would formulate them, remember them, say them at the right moment to the chosen person, the person in need. His friend, the poet, Roberto Juarros, tells a story about running into him into the, into, running into him in the street. Porchia had been visiting a friend in the hospital, someone who was sick and alone. He repeated to me the phrase with which he had tried to encourage her. To have company is not to be with someone, but in someone. It is likely that moments like this preceded writing them down. Portia did write them down, sometimes drawing them in a kind of painting, but also in a manuscript called Voices, Voices, which was published in 1943 in a run of 1,000 copies. It sold poorly. This Italian immigrant to Argentina, a cargo clerk by trade, had few literary connections outside of the small circle of self-educated painters and writers. He ended up with many copies stashed in his house, which were eventually mailed out to community libraries in the poor regions of the provinces. Some of these copies were read and copied out by hand or by typewriter. It was one of these duplicates that Roberto Juarros first discovered. Some of these duplicates were themselves photocopied and the copied themselves copied and so on until the voices, voices were blurry and hard to read or until the first few pages had fallen off and what was stapled together had neither title nor author. Porchia was born in 1885 and came to Argentina as a young man as part of a massive wave of immigration. He was 58 when the Voces, Voices were first published. He was discovered by the international and thus national literary establishment in the person of Roger Calois, who prompted the prominent literary magazine Sur to publish him. By the time Porchia delivered copy, Calois was back in Paris. The Argentine editors communicated to Porchia that there were grammatical errors in the voices. 
the voices. Some had been corrected and he was to approve the changes. Porchia went to their offices, listened, said nothing, no discussion. He asked for his original back and left, no publication. It is possible that the grammatical strangeness of some of the voces or voices is due to an Italian or dialectal substratum in Porchia's Spanish. It is also possible that these rather prosaic if abstract sayings had here and there a kind of poetic term. After all, some do sound like this. Sometimes at night, I turn on a light so as not to see. Or this, the soul killer does not kill a hundred souls. It kills just one soul a hundred times. Or this, people, when they know there is something comical, do not laugh. Or even this, when I die, I will not see myself die for the first time. The voices have an effect of wisdom, which invites comparison with wise sayings or proverbs. And this is perhaps where the aphorism reference came from. But as Cesar Aira has pointed out, the manual laborer Porchia was doing something with language akin to what Escher did with his images. Using simple tricks of logic and syntax to generate the poetic or wisdom effect like this. You are a puppet, but in the hands of the infinite that are perhaps your hands. Or this, yes, this is bad, but it was good. And now I do not understand how it could have been good. And now I do not understand how it could be bad. Or even this. And if you are someone in what is all, you are someone of what is all and in what is all, not someone of what you are and in what you are. Of what you are and in what you are, you are no one in what is all. You do not exist. Meanwhile, Carlois translated some voices or voices into voix in French that appeared in Parisian magazines around 1948. This is how Porchia was discovered and appreciated by Henry Miller and André Breton. He was invited to Paris to speak with the Surrealists the next year, but declined. He never left the province of Buenos Aires. Porchia had no direct inheritor, though there are Porchian moments in the poetry of Roberto Juarros and other Argentines such as Mario Morales and Alejandra Pizarnik. Indirectly, many people know the voices or voices, often without knowing their author or source. Porchia died, like many other people in dreams, in 1968. His voices are in the process of slipping into anonymity. Okay, now all I have left is the credits. So the, the poem uh, about the Japanese translator it's by Jorge Santiago Perednik, an Argentine poet. There were two short prose pieces by the Mexican writer Alfonso Reyes. Uh, How to Write a Novel is by the Argentine writer Roberto Art. And the three uh, autobiographies are by Art and me in collaboration. <laughs> uh, uh, and then the, the Life of Porchia is by me. Uh, the sayings by Portia were done in collaboration with Joshua Beckman. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to um, introduce our next reader. Um, Sarah Jaffe, who is our next reader, will be giving um, a class tomorrow. Um, just to let you all know, at 10 a.m., the title of the class is Unsafe is Not a Feeling, How Writing Contends with the Illusion of Safety. For those of you out there who are interested in attending uh, the classes, 
Um, there's information on our website on how to get there. PNCA Low Residency Creative Writing. Sarah Jaffe is a writer, educator, and musician living in Portland, Oregon. Her first novel, Dry Land, was published by Tin House Books in 2015 and will be released in the UK by Cypher Press in 2021. Her short fiction essays and criticism have appeared in publications including Catapult, Vents, Bomb, Noon, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She co-edited The Art of Touring, an anthology of writing and visual art by musicians drawing on her experience as guitarist for post-punk band Erase Errata. She holds an MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has received fellowships from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Radar Productions, and the Regional Arts and Cultural Council. She is also co-founding editor of New Herring Press, a publisher of prose chapbooks. Welcome, Sarah Jaffe. Thank you so much. Um, how's the, is the sound happening okay? Yeah? It is. Okay, Good. great. Yeah. Um, I am so happy to be here, Alejandro. Thank you for that wonderful reading. Um, it was really exciting to hear you read. Um, okay, so, um, okay, one thing I'm gonna say is that um, I have a five-year-old with a heavy footfall above me I'm in the basement. And so though I'm wearing headphones, you might hear some stomping going on. Um, okay, so um, the story I'm gonna read is actually also called Unsafe is Not a Feeling. Um, I have been preoccupied with um, that statement and what it might mean. And I thought I would read the story tonight um, uh, so as a kind of lead into the talk slash uh, making session tomorrow um, for those who wish to attend. So um, yeah, here we go. Unsafe is not a feeling. On the morning after, I happened to have a therapy appointment. I thought about not going because I didn't know who'd be riding the buses or out in the streets. But I suspected that beneath the murk was a quiver of feelings I needed to uncover in order to aim or absorb them. My therapist looked less tired than I felt. I wasn't her first appointment of the day. She began as she always did by inhaling and exhaling deeply. It was an invitation to arrive. I had arrived six minutes late. I thought I might feel unsafe on the bus, I said, so I rode my bike. My therapist finished her exhale I always meant to notice the moment when her regular breathing resumed. It's a good morning for a ride, she said, but remember, unsafe isn't a feeling. If she had told me this before, I would have remembered. She might have meant that it was something I should remember going forward. But what if she truly believed that she was telling me this for the second or third time and that I'd forgotten? This would mean the reason my body was beginning to feel hot was because I felt misperceived. One of the feelings I'd learned in therapy, I hated feeling most. I can tell from your body language that you're not experiencing yourself as seen right now, my therapist said. Let's dig. Do you feel scared, sad, threatened? In therapy, I was used to experiencing myself as a sieve, a bum mirror, a talking machine. My body language was typically involuntary. Scared, I said though that sounded so much more specific. Around us, potted plants offered oxygen. Good, my therapist said, this is a safe space. I took that to mean the space we were in was structurally sound. The beams would persist, the floor would hold us. Though I'd always been confused that both flammable and inflammable meant easily catching fire. I took a sip from my mug of water. I'd wanted to take a disposable plastic cup, but felt guilty. I hated drinking water from opaque vessels, which gave the water a quality of taintedness. 
My therapist asked me to describe some of the things I was scared of. She suggested I start at the beginning. Well, first, scary movies, I said, especially when you see the back of someone's head and they look normal and then they turn around and their face is all chewed up and bloody or glowing eyes. Some people enjoy that feeling, my therapist said. They enjoy feeling scared or they call it something different. That was a question I'd always been meaning to ask. They're thrill seekers, she said. They're scareaholics. They'll take any name you give them. What else? Fraternities, I said, and sororities, but a little less so. I could see her legal pad. She'd written down the word beer and underlined it. <laughs> I know some of them do community service, I said. My therapist put down her pencil and sat up straight. She knocked her hands in loose fists on her lap and looked at me as if she really saw me. What about being taken away in the night and forced to wear a yellow star, excuse me, and a pink triangle on your pea coat? Am I scared of that? How are you scared of that? I tried to really think about it. It wasn't as if it was something I'd never thought about even before it had become clear that Ohio, then Florida, then Wisconsin were lost to us. I didn't currently have a pea coat, but I'd had one, sure. Presumably, I wouldn't be the first one taken. I would see others taken first and have some way to prepare, unless I was in a bubble, in denial, or if I was strong. Would I have any notice, do you think, realistically? You'd be one of the ones to get notice, she said. I expect you'd be in that 10%. Was she flattering me, flirting? I had once had a case of transference for a therapist, but that was because she wore turtlenecks that reminded me of my first grade teacher with long beaded necklaces that signaled the fact that under the turtleneck was skin. I don't know if I'd want the notice, I said. It might be better to be surprised. You're scared of preparing, my therapist said. Yes, I admitted. I don't make to-do lists because I hate to find old lists with some of the items still undone. I feel that way about old Kleenex, she said, staring at a faraway point. I wondered how many clients my therapist had already asked about their fears that morning. I wondered if she was getting worn out asking the same questions over and over, but I didn't wonder too hard because I was scared of knowing too much personal information about my therapist. My therapist snapped back to her typical implacability. This is good, she said, this is important. Let's keep going. Are you afraid of heights? Sometimes. Snakes? Yes. The idea of snakes? No. We were on a fast track now, as if every session with my therapist had become one super session, as if we were a therapist and patient on a TV series and someone had assembled a highlight reel. Are you scared of taking a cab? No. Are you scared to sit next to someone on a bus wearing a hijab? No, I said, the reel jerked. That's not what I was saying before. How about on a plane? I'm not scared of that, I said. Which water fountain do you use, the whites or the non? They don't do that anymore, I said. Let's dig, my therapist said. Because I was there and because I was paying, I picked up my mug and took a drink of water and I dug until I found the black door. It was a door at the high school I went to. The word was that if you were white and you went through the door, you would get jumped. I didn't use that door, but not because I was white or because I wasn't black or because I was scared that I would get jumped. I didn't live in the direction the door led to. I remember, I said, hearing my voice from far away, as if I were watching the playback later, that I wished there was a white door, not in the same way as the white kids in our processing groups who said the black door was racist. Those were the kinds of white kids who got sent to Catholic school when their parents heard about the black door. I paused, expecting my therapist to say something. I realized my eyes were closed. Not like the white kids who walk through the black door on purpose in order to get jumped. It was harder for girls to do that, I said. I heard my therapist take a sip of water. She felt close to me, as if she'd reached over and sipped from my mug. What I wished for was a white door that was worse than the black door, a really bad door, a decrepit door that got stuck, that you had to duck to get through, that led to the basement where rats and snakes lived. I didn't continue from my therapist, but I remembered the full diorama. Through the door were details culled from the footage they showed on TV after the white cop had shot the black kid in the elementary schoolyard. Flashing lights, caution tape, something wet on the ground. Later, the overturned and burning cop cars. I hated the white cop and I was closer to him. I said, I wanted the rats to chew off my skin. I waited for judgment to come down. 
in, said my therapist. What, I said, now out. I watched her deflate herself, a slow-mo reversal of a flower's unfolding. The room was pillowed with quiet sounds, the air purifier, the computer hum, the water cooler in the waiting room with the attached dispenser holding a full sleeve of plastic cups. I can't, I said, breathing. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Beautiful reading, thank you. Before I introduce our final reader, I would like to thank um, a donor, Collins Foundation, for um, a grant that they gave to our program. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Pacific Power, who's donated money to our program. Our final reader tonight is Vicky now. V is the author of four poetry collections, Human Tetris, Sheep Machine, Umbilical Hospital, The Old Philosopher, which was the winner of the Night Book Prize in 2014. And she's the author of the short story collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, winner of 2016 FC2's Ronald Sukunek Innovative Fiction Award, the novel Fish in Exile. Her work includes drawings, poetry, fiction, film, and cross-genre collaboration. She was the Fall 2019 Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute. Please welcome Vicky Now. Um, thank you for Jay for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Sarah and Alejandro for reading with me. Um, so I'm going to give you a sample a bit of uh, a little bit of my work of each. And um, so I'll start with some poems and then maybe a genre bending piece and then and then maybe a nonfiction. This piece is called Human Content. Over lice and not ice, over lice and not rice, we discuss our human content. It's not like I could Crop rotate your grandpa, your hair dye blonde for softness to regrow. I know your love for me isn't a cheesecake factory, hollow <laughs> out by the pleasure point of mice. Their teeth vampires wearing clothes made of curds and Muslim shoes choked by compounded interests. I am just a cake wrapped in salt and archaic human content. Mm -hmm. And I have baked a dozen times for your swimming pool to drown my silhouette. Tears have salt content and can smile when dropped in a lake of amnesia, ignorant protest lootings. I want you to fall back asleep with me after your mother comes out of the closet as butter. This piece is called, it's genre bending and it's called don't photosynthesize my love. The deep affection between the two women began long ago in the early days of autumn 
where the desert wind has kicked his legs high in the air, kicking so high, the barren earth could see the clouds billowing, swelling with gas and gas across his white hand. The night travel far into darkness with his invisible wheel, a glide of timelessness. And fog passed his time by sitting on top of hill while swinging his legs back and forth in between the gore and abyss. And the same time has slipped away without conveying its feelings for nothingness. Shacks of houses sat begrudgingly against the short bodies of Ocotillos, original to the Chicotuan and Sororian deserts. Daphne has returned home carrying a bundle of Ponderosa pines on her back. The light has emptied its eye beneath the mountain. There was a faint residue of light hollowing the long and wide bodies of the detritus Palo Verdes and the slender bodies of the desert willows. Daphne took one leaf-like glance at it before cracking the heavy door wood door of their abode with a thud and dropping a load off her back. She had closed the door and entered the kitchen with the fireplace aglow with heat. The place was engorged with this rifting silence that has conveyed that time here was low and half fractured as if there was a gap in this mortal coil reserved for those who no longer found rigor with youth. Though both women were youthful and even young in their maturity, Daphne sat down in a chair next to the stove. After all, she has just collected wood, collected wood for their short winter months ahead after a forest fire. After removing her flowering boots and seeding bearing socks, she walks toward the fireplace barefootedly. Her foliage pressed against the skull of the earth. She placed her soil hand against the rocky wall and studied the, pose, the posing cadence of the fire. The fire made her inner leaf curled and part of her face cracked in response to the desiccated exchange. When she, return, when she turned her gaze, alakine and chalky with soil, away from the music of the heat, Daisy was standing there in her yellow blouse and burdened jeans, looking more and more perennial and fertile with each passing second. It was no longer diurnal, but quite diurnal and radiant, she appeared. How was it? Dry and brittle. Are you tired? Very. So I prepare you something dorsal. Daphne shook her head. Daisy turned her back away and moved her body like a pendulous leaf towards the bathroom. With the fire glowing bright, brightly, and it was hard for her to photosynthesize. When she returned, a wet hand cloth draped over her wrist. She walks toward Daphne, lifting one of her hands to begin to scrub the dirt off her. Flipping the cloth over, she took the other hand and gently kneaded the earth's dark flower, ash, and smoke onto it. It left an embryonic stain that appeared like a cat's paw print than anything as epigeal. And when the stem intertwined, Daphne lifted Daisy Bredescent's hands toward her lips and kissed them softly. And in seconds, she was exploring her throat with the musculaturity and the situa of her kisses. Please don't photosynthesize, she begged softly as she laid her mouth gently and ardently on her exposed neck. With each kiss, she felt as if her body was defoliating. It was too late. Had she asked for the impossible? Pollution from warmth was difficult fleece to wear in the winter months. And when they made love that light evening, there was chlorophyll plasma membrane, an oxygen content from earth organic synthesis from a long time ago. Daisy, smaller and more ephemeral, heaved beneath Daphne clusters of seed, radical, and root hairs. Their bodies moved this way because Daisy was apogeal and her lover epigeal. Only in the way they burst forth from stem to stem in their orgasm. Their love making was their first sign of germination, their way of being in the world post embryonically. 
And when two leaves made love in their human form, was that love born from vascularity or hun honeysuckleness? Or was that love tenorferous and ambiguous? When Daphne pins Daisy so barbetuanally, could she ever stop photosynthesizing? Could she never remain the same in the same body ever again? Was her lover, was her lover outreach mulching post-coitally? Where in time could they be together? Beneath the fingernail of the soil, above ground when they are withering and shredding in their desert breeze. Time made her skin grief atom by atom, even when darkness clothed their ardor with the moisture from the moonlight. Both Daphne and Daisy felt naked from both being alive and dead. Nothing could clothe their vulnerability from a chemical event, not even smoke and pollution. And then I'm going to read a short nonfiction piece. It's from my memoir. It's called, It's a Fish Sitting on My Face. My father was experiencing the power of money when we first came to the United States as refugees. He did not want to waste any of it on a coin operated laundry. He asked my mother to hand wash all of our clothes and bed sheets. He asked her to do this because at long last he was the breadwinner. But I think in my, ma my father's youth, he must have experienced poverty, poverty at a level I have never experienced and a starvation that turns into a perverse kind of control. My sister and I would wonder how my mother was able to live through such hardship, but perhaps my mother's tolerance for pain isn't infinite. In Long Khan, in front of my grandmother's front yard, there's a well, and beyond that well is Long Khan's famous railroad track. I get gone walk along the railroad track as I watch my father Toss hay, debris, and trash over his shoulder with a broom with a pyramid made of compost. The Viet Cong in his green uniform, the color of meconium, battered my father's back. My father turned his shoulder to shield himself from the pommel. I remember my father bent forward like a broken chair, his feet just before the tablecloth. I watched my father bend to the will of a theory. A theoretical framework was beating his back and my father did not fight back. I was seven years old or perhaps younger. I remember that the coffee beans were bursting forth brightly in Lung Khan's fields and I thought the coffee beans could save my father if he had some to throw at the Viet Cong's face. Memory can be the wind on someone's back. It rides there like a moment before fleeing into a field of oblivion. But this memory is no wind. It's a fish sitting on my face. I've never understood my father's deep hatred for my mother. It must be that my father was jealous of my mother's beauty. He wanted to be as beautiful as my mother. It must be this and nothing else. Growing up in our house near the railroad track, I used to open doors and shut doors like the paparazzi were after us. A plethora of men came to court my already married mother. They didn't care. Sorry, I lost my footing. Oh, well, I'll just end there since I can't find it. But you can read the rest of it later. Thank you, V. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank everybody. I want to. Thank our readers again, uh, Vicky Now, Sarah Jaffe, and Alejandro de Acosta. And I um, really appreciate everybody's comments, all the love that's happening through the comment field. And um, our next reading is Sunday evening, Perrin Kearns, um, Brandon Shimoda, and Tyrone Williams will be reading at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Thank you, Weston. Yeah, uh, glad to help. Great. Thank you. Good yep, to see you.
Alejandro, V, Sarah, great reading. Thank you. I can leave, yeah? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See you.